Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon. On the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, Lazy Learners of the World, Unite. On tonight's episode, I am joined once again by my good friend, Jonathan Streeter from Thoughts on Things and Stuff, otherwise known as Thinker of Thoughts, as we continue our Herculean effort to go through general conference from last April. We have managed to go through the first session, the second session, the Saturday evening session, and most of the Sunday morning session. It was our intent in this episode to complete the Sunday afternoon, the final session of general conference, but we did not quite make it. In fact, we didn't even get close to making it because we had to start with a talk that we had not yet covered. It was the talk at the end of the Sunday morning session of General Conference. It was a talk given by President Nelson, and it was perhaps the most controversial talk in the entire General Conference from April of 2021. This talk has come to be known affectionately as the Lazy Learners Talk. And as Jonathan Streeter and I analyzed it, we found there was more and more to talk about, more and more to unpack, until ultimately it actually took the full two hours for us to do justice to President Nelson's Lazy Learners Talk. I hope you'll enjoy this episode. I know that I enjoyed making it. By the way, if you are a lazy learner like me, I'd like for you to go to RadioFreeMormon.org right now, click on the donate button, and make a contribution. If you could, make it a monthly recurring contribution. $10 a month, $20 a month, $50 a month, whatever you can afford. Your contributions will keep Radio Free Mormon broadcasting behind enemy lines. And now on to our discussion and in-depth analysis of the Lazy Learners Talk by President Nelson from April General Conference 2021. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Talk on Things and Stuff, where we are hopefully wrapping up our spring 2021 general conference breakdown and review with none other than Radio Free Mormon. RFM, how are you doing today? Good morning, Jonathan Streeter. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. Um, I know we have a lot to cover and I don't want to, you know, dilute the air with too much banter, but um, it's been a couple of weeks since we did the last session and I'm looking forward to uh, some of today's comments. Well, great. I am too. Let's get into it. All right. So what do we got first up on our docket today? Well, we have a number of things. First off, though, I did want to point out that wonderful work you did when we talked about Elder Oaks and the talk he gave to the uh, Law Society at um, at BYU a number of years ago on their anniversary. And you made um, a list of Dallin H. Oaks rules on lying. Now, this was not my list. This was purely your creative content. But it struck some of our listeners so heavily that they took themselves this is from a listener who made a postcard. No way. <laughs> way. And sent it to me. And one to me. Oh, nice. See? Remember that one? Oh, that's, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the model of George Costanza's rules online, but uh, as articulated through the divinely inspired mouthpiece of Dallin H. Hawks. <laughs> Okay, so having said that, having said that now, we don't get to jump into the sad, uh, the Sunday afternoon session, although I can't believe we're here finally, finally. The end is in sight. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel of General Conference April 2021, but, mm. but there is one other talk we have to talk about, which was the Sunday morning session, the final talk. Mm. Oh, that's right, yeah. President Nelson, we don't want to miss that yes. because that's going to go down in history as the lazy learners talk. Oh, that's true. We definitely have to cover that. All right. We had gotten up to that point in the last episode, but it would be remiss of us. Indeed, we would be ungrateful if we did not consider the words of the living prophet of God on the face of the earth today, as given in the Easter morning session. All right. So So while you're looking that up, I will mention the fact, as a recap, that the rest of that morning this is the last talk in the sunday morning session but every talk before this if you will recall 
President Nelson wanted to hear the gospel preached by somebody from basically every nation on the earth, every continent, not every nation, that would take a while, but every continent at least, except for Antarctica. And so he did that, and there were about six or seven speakers from all over the world, although they all have one thing in common, which is they're all officers or authorities in the LDS church. And they all talk about Jesus Christ in one way or another. And now President Nelson is going to come on the scene and wrap up this Sunday morning session. After he's had all these people speak from all over the world, he will give us his thoughts about Jesus. And actually, he's going to give us his thoughts about faith and miracles and lazy learners. Now, do you have timestamp 1.00 on that by now, Jonathan? Yeah, absolutely. Let me, let's see. It's called, the name of the talk is What We Are Learning and Will Never Forget. And we no. are at times. Okay, hold, hold on. It. Make sure I get the right one. Okay, this is the last talk in the Sunday morning session. It's Christ is Risen, semicolon, faith in him will move mountains. Okay, okay. Let me see. Maybe they renamed it. Oh, no, no. Okay, yeah. No, we got it. Okay, here we go. Boop. Okay, great. All right. And by the way, when President Nelson says faith in him will move mountains, he makes it clear later. He's not really talking about real mountains. He's just sort of talking about metaphorical mountains. Okay, so let's bring that onto our screen and go to timestamp 100. You are a phenomenon. All right, just verify for me that you can hear it when it starts playing with a thumbs up. This morning, we have heard from church leaders who come from every populated continent on earth. Truly, the blessings of the gospel are for every race, language, and people. The church of Jesus Christ is a global church. Jesus Christ is our leader. Thankfully, even the pandemic has not been able to slow the onward march of his truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ is exactly what is needed in this confused, contentious, and weary world. Okay, there we go. So there's the first sound bite. Hello? Okay. Uh, You're going to have to be a little quicker than that, Jonathan, if you're going to play with me. Are you there? I can't hear you now. I can hear President Nelson, but I can't hear you. Have you been spitting dumb like Corey Hoare? No, this is Sorry, funny. I muted my microphone so you wouldn't hear all my clicks. <laughs> oh, there we go. Was, there we go. I was I click, pulling out the notes from last time. All right. Sorry about that. I'm That's my problem. We're actually experiencing a miracle of sorts here. We're not going to see one in general conference, but I thought we might see one on Thinker of Thoughts. Yeah, the miracle is going to be if we don't have any technical glitches. That's the miracle. <laughs> okay. So there's a couple of things I want to say about that, if we can all recall what it was that President Nelson said. Um. <sighs> Truly, the blessings of the gospel are for every race, language, and people. Now, Mm. that's problematic to me only because we all know that prior to 1978, the blessings of the gospel were not for every race. There was a certain priesthood ban that was going on respecting certain people who couldn't go to the temple. They couldn't get married in the temple, and uh, the men could not get the priesthood. And, of course, I'm speaking about... Uh, those uh, African-Americans or or African-Africans, anybody with that lineage would seem to be, no, there's a ban there. So when he says the blessings of the gospel are for every race, what he's saying at the same time, unfortunately, is that since 1978, and apparently for some reason, for the prior 125 years, the blessings of the gospel were not for every race. Yeah. And they had a special way of making sense of that back in the time. Uh, they would say, well, the blessings of the gospel, the most important blessings, the blessings of salvation that you can get through baptism are accessible to every race. It's just the added responsibility and duties of the priesthood, you know, that that's not for every race. But it's just like the tribe of uh, Aaron could, was the only one that could hold the priesthood. And so there's nothing wrong with that. That's in the Bible. You didn't have a problem with that. So we shouldn't have a problem with the race. And these are some of the defenses that were proffered when people said, well, wait a second. Why are we preventing black people from the full blessings of the gospel? Right. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. But um, but yeah, that's what it always makes me think of. And it also makes me think of when he says that the blessings of the gospel are for every race, language and people. 
I'm not sure that that's true even today, that the blessings of the gospel are for every people. And here I'm thinking about the LGBT Mm. community. Uh, The blessings of the gospel are really not for every people unless you stop being who you are and start either uh, acting straight or becoming straight. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, There's a, a video that you can find from the 2018 era where we just where I do a breakdown of that very concept, which is that, you know, if we told black people back in 1977, you know, you can have the priesthood, you can have everything. All you have to do is paint your face white. You have to be what you have to act white, do everything, remove every aspect of your black ancestry away from you and walk around with white face paint, then you can do it all. We'd say, well, that's ridiculous. You're asking them to pretend to be something that they're not just so they can have access to it. But when you look at what they're asking gay people to do in order to gain access to leadership, to temple blessings, to everything, it's essentially the same thing. We're saying put on straight face, take all of those aspects of your innate personhood as a gay person and suppress it and put on the the outer performance of straightness that we want you to put on, you know, we'll let you say you're gay, but you can't act on that in any way that is meaningful, then you can have access to anything. So it's essentially the same paradigm. It's just rather on the issue of race, it's on the issue of sexual orientation. And, you know, I have no doubt that at some point they will see the inherent um, problem with that. Yes. And the inherent problem with that will be too many people leaving the church. (laughs) <laughs> that's the only way they're going to see the problem with this. And, I know, I, and you, you know, we used to be able to say too many people leaving the church and they're going to just lose out on all those sweet tithing funds. But now that we know the scope of the church's wealth, the fact that it has, a, you know, an an engine of revenue generation that is basically limitless. It's like having a gas tank that always fills itself up so that you never have to fill yourself with gas. Tithing does not matter. We don't even have to make those jokes anymore because tithing really doesn't matter. Right, right. And the thing about money is that it doesn't have any free will, so you can bend it Mm -hmm. to your will, unlike people. Yeah, that's very true. So they try as hard as they can. And now the next line in this one paragraph where he's going to repeat what he said in the very opening comments he made at the beginning of conference on Saturday morning, he's going to repeat the same sentiment where he says, thankfully, even a pandemic has not been able to slow the onward march of his truth. And back in the other comments, he was talking about how the Lord is hastening his work, even with a worldwide pandemic going on. And in the very first series First episode of this series, we commented about that and said, I don't think that's really true. Not unless you are defining growth or uh, not being slowed in some way other than membership growth or most of the other normal indicators that we would think would be this. Which they've done before. They've said that, you know, the church is growing. Well, what do you mean by growing? Well, the strength of the testimony of the members is growing. And so you can just frame it as that rather than the church is numerically growing or anything like that. Or or you could say, you know, the church is growing. What do you mean it's growing? Well, the assets within the Ensign Peak funds are growing. You know, there's any number of ways that you want to define growing. You can do it. You just don't have to talk about the specifics. And then it gives you the right propaganda notes that you need to hit. Right. And I will just say in concluding on this paragraph that it is clear to me that regardless of how he's measuring it, This is a message that is very important to President Nelson to get across because this is the second time he's saying it. And I think he's concerned that people are thinking the church isn't growing, that it's slowing down. And so he wants to let them know it is growing. Nothing's been able to slow the onward march of his truth, even a pandemic. That's how strong, how vibrant, how true, if you will, the LDS church is. Yeah. You know, it strikes me, how much pressure must there be on every president of the church to make sure that the church is left stronger and better positioned when they pass on and shuffle off this mortal coil than when they started? Because it's their legacy. You know, they spend their entire life as company men, yes men, trying to get to that seat. And once they get into that seat, the tone of their tenure, the effect of, you know, where the church stands at the end of that tenure is sort of a judgment on who they were as a prophet. 
And with every one of his moves, I get the feeling that he's got this urgency to make sure that the church has somehow left an indelible mark with his signature on it that is better than it was before. And he's got challenges like no other prophet before him. So, uh, you know, I feel a little bit of, of empathy with the pressure that he must be under. Yeah, it's not his fault that the church is tanking under his administration. No, well, it just happens. Maybe it is well. like if... <laughs> I think he bears a little responsibility. You know, if you just happen to be the Pope when the printing press technology is released and, and um, you know, everyone can now read the scriptures for themselves and start to uh, connect with God outside of the religious authority of the Catholic Church in the, in you know, right before the Renaissance or whatever, then it's just chance. But guess what? You're the, you're the Pope when the printing press happened, when the, um, when that Bible, I can't remember the name of it, first made a big splash. Was it like Gutenberg? That's the one, the Gutenberg Bible. <laughs> it is too early in the morning, obviously. You would get that any other time. Can we go to timestamp 523? Because now we have two paragraphs, which is the lazy learners quote. This is the money quote. I've already said quite a bit about this in other fora. So I'm going to want to hear your thoughts about this when he gets to the last line. Do you have that, Jonathan? Right. Yep, I got it queued up. My dear brothers and sisters, my call to you this Easter morning is to start today to increase your faith. Through your faith, Jesus Christ will increase your ability to move the mountains in your life. Are these real mountains? Though your personal challenges may loom as large as Mount Everest. Apparently not. Your mountains may be loneliness, doubt, illness, or other personal problems. Okay, so not real mountains. Your mountains will vary. And yet the answer to each of your challenges is to increase your faith. That takes work. Lazy learners and lax disciples will always struggle to muster even a particle of faith. Okay, there you go. What are your thoughts about that, Jonathan? Oh, by the way, if you can take that off the screen, I've got this here. <laughs> Every time the church comes out to try to demonize ex-Mormons or people who doubt or criticize, it's so fun to see how they take the demonization, embrace it, and then just wear it proudly because it's it's kind of like, you know, it's sort of like how evil apostate, the, char the puppet character, I mean, he's a, really a dragon or whatever, Brow proudly banishes evil apostates. It's like, okay, if you're going to take all of these things that are good in the world that just happen to contradict your proprietary moral edicts and call them evil, then I'm just going to embrace that and I'm going to lean into it. Um, and it's going to be an ironic form of satire that points out how ridiculous your claim to moral authority is. And so that's kind of what the lazy learners tagline has come up with. I, he starts out this um, this particular part of the talk um, really drawing on something that's not even specific to Mormonism, this idea that you can have the faith to move mountains. And I don't know if when that stanza first entered the religious lexicon hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago, whether that was intended to be metaphor or literal, because the ability of the human mind to use metaphor to teach lessons or to inspire people did not like suddenly pop into being in the modern age. Like that, that certainly it's in Christ's parables, it's, it's in classic literature and ancient literature. And so I don't have a problem with it always being metaphor, because I think people have drawn strength from metaphors like that, that, that inspire them. And, but we're here seeing a very uh, significant and intentional transition from a literal interpretation to a metaphorical t interpretation. And, and he's doing it by identifying that these mountains, and he's kind of giving us something to really hammer down on. When people are struggling with things, he's saying, okay, we can take this scripture about moving mountains. And we can say, it's not about transforming, terraforming the earth. It's about overcoming the actual challenges that you have in your life that may loom as large as mountains. So I think from the perspective of a religious leader trying to inspire people to find meaning, to find resilience and strengthen themselves because because of their grounding in faith, his messaging is spot on for that. He does a brilliant job in terms of giving a real personal connection to his audience on this. And so this is, it's kind of the classic thing where they do a really good job of alluding to the things that 
um, many people find inspiration and strength in on a foundation of religious belief, but then he poisons it and he makes it that it's not just about finding strength within yourself based on stories that give you meaning. It's now about you in order to have access to that strength. In order to do that, you have to comply. You have to do the work. When he says that takes work. Now, this is all of the strength, all of the um, the power that you can get from what he's alluding to in, in terms of faith moving mountains now is dangled as a carrot in front of you, but you have to now do what what they say. And and you could take that message and just keep it at that. It's a message of inspiration, but there's some requirements. But then he, at the very end, just turns it on its head and now uses it as an indictment of people who doubt or have a hard time practicing faith. Now, I watched the recent episode that you and Bill Rill did with Spencer Wright, and you spoke a little bit about what is faith and the nature of faith. And one of the points that you made was that the harder some, the more detached something is from objective reality, from testable data, observable claims, the more you have to use faith in order to hold on to it because you can't use logic or rationality. And the further it gets away from logic and rationality, the more faith you have to have. And so you made the point that every time that they talk about things that you have to use an increasing amount of faith to, those are things that are becoming harder and harder to believe. They're more detached from anything that has any verifiable or corroborative data. And so that's what's happening to the church is that people are learning objective facts and reality. They're using their logical, rational mind, and they're finding it harder to believe because once they do that, they realize how far away from observable, testable, rational um, data the claims of the church are. And so their inability to have faith is not a personal failing. It's not a weakness. It's born out of learning greater amounts of knowledge, developing sharper uh, skills of analyzing knowledge and being able to distinguish things that are false from things that are true. And once they learn and gain and flex those muscles and strengthen them, it's harder to believe because you can no longer have faith because faith in something that isn't true is more appropriately termed a delusion. And they're starting to realize that things that they had faith about were actually delusions. And they were delusions born of uh, propaganda, whitewashing, uh, psychological manipulation. And when you start to understand the nature of those things, it becomes harder to have faith. So he's taking that process now and he's demonizing it rather than understanding that it's the baseless foundation of the truth claims of the church. He's saying that it's the laziness of the people and the fact that they're not learning. What he means is you're not learning the right way. You're not coming to the right conclusions and you're resting on your own personal judgment and rationality. And that's just lazy. You're supposed to do all of the mental gymnastics that it requires in order to maintain this system of belief. Because believe you me, it takes a lot of mental gymnastics. Just flip through the pages of the Fair Mormon website and you're going to see implausible rationalization and logical fallacy after logical fallacy that you have to have in order to keep this structure built up. And it takes a lot of mental effort. And so if you take people who aren't willing to do that mental gymnastics, label them as lazy and demonize them, it's going to, you know, play into the mindset that you're trying to inculcate in the faithful, which is that we can now look down on and demonize the people who don't buy into it. But it's not going to bring people back into the fold. It's going to further alienate people. It's going to alienate people from their families because, they're, you know, with every person who doubts and leaves the church, there's now a fractured family if they have people who stay in the church because the people who stay in the church that still love and want to connect with their family who doubt and have left are being fed messages that you now have to see them as lazy, see them as less than because of talks like this. And so it doesn't bring people together. It does not speak out of love. It speaks out of condemnation and judgment. And that is the pattern that this man is establishing for members of the church to deal with their loved ones and friends who are, you know, choosing to trust in their own conscience, in their own logic when they examine the claims of the church. So that's my spiel on that. Um, <clears throat> now, I know you've, you've in several different forums, talked about this, but make sure that I, I want to hear kind of after you've heard all the commentary on this, what is your kind of takeaway from this part of his talk? Well, I think that you're correct. And as I look at it and listen to you, 
when he says in the context of his talk, lazy learners and lax disciples will always struggle to muster even a particle of faith. A lazy learner is a person who doesn't study the things that they're supposed to study, that the church wants them to study. And a lax disciple is a person who doesn't do the things that the church wants them to do. So if you are out of the, if you're not studying everything we want you to study, i.e. come follow me, scriptures, whatever. Um, and if you're not uh, doing everything you're supposed to do as a Mormon, then those people who are not totally in by the book, doing everything they're supposed to do, studying everything they're supposed to study, those people will always struggle to muster even a particle of faith. So faith is available by this only to those people who are fully active and observant Mormons. And, and the thing is that paradigm is true in the Jehovah's Witnesses and in Scientology. You know, if you don't study the approved texts of the Jehovah's Witness and obey the actions that you're supposed to do as a Jehovah's Witness, then you're probably not going to muster a particle of faith in the claims of the Jehovah's Witness. And that's true. You know, if you shield yourself from indoctrination and propaganda, then chances are you're not going to place a lot of stock in them. But that's a good thing when that indoctrination and propaganda is based on lies, deception, and manipulation. You just have to realize that that's going on. Yes, and part of the problem, first off, going back to what you talked about, metaphorical mountains, and this is a good message, got it, agree. But within Mormonism, this metaphorical idea, a likely metaphorical idea when Jesus announces it in the New Testament, right, gets taken into the Book of Mormon and then literalized. Do you remember the name of the mountain that gets moved in the Book of Mormon, Jonathan? Oh my goodness. No, I don't. Please let I'm me know. Do the Jeopardy music. Zarin. Zarin. Really? Z E R I N. Oh, yes. Ether, chapter 12, verse 30. Um, that is a mountain of which we know nothing except what is contained in the following passage. For the brother of Jared said unto the mountain Zarin, remove. And da da dum, it was removed. Oh, Z E R I N. Yeah. Right there. So it's, you see, this idea of moving mountains is literalized in Mormonism and then canonized in the Book of Mormon. So to have the president of the LDS Church come out and now completely deliteralize moving mountains has its own value, of course, but it ends up sort of being in tension with the foundational book of Scripture. We're taking what we mm. thought was literal or could be literal. And now saying, no, we're not even going to talk about that. These mountains are not real mountains. These are problems that you have in your life. And you cannot overcome those problems. See, you can't overcome those problems unless you do everything that we're supposed to do, that we tell you to do, study everything that we tell you to study. And unless you do that, you cannot muster even a particle of faith, which is what you have to have is the faith to overcome the problems. Yeah. And it's so funny because he's... You know, the, the whole premise there is that there's some, unless you do what we tell you to do, believe the things that we tell you to do, then there's something broken or wrong about you. And it's a concept called manufactured dependence, which you see in totalistic groups all over the place. And the ironic thing is, it's like you wonder sometimes, you know, do the, do, do the members, do the brethren know these concepts? Do they realize they're engaging in these concepts? And Every week I do a search for state conference in the last week on YouTube. And then I just kind of click through and you just go to every state conference live stream that has happened and then just look at the last speaker because the last speaker is always the highest ranking authority. And so if you want to find out where the apostles have actually been, you can do that and you might stumble on uh, an apost apostolic talk that is otherwise, you know, you're not going to have access to it. Well, I did that this last weekend, an elder gong, it turns out, talked in Meridian, Idaho, and he gave a talk and he alludes to this concept of manufactured dependence. And so they understand it. I just want to play the start of this little clip because you can see how it plays into what we're talking about here. So let's see here. We'll add it to stream and go. We live in a time when people want us to think that there's something wrong with us. It's one of the ways they sell us things. They get us to buy things. They tell us 
We're too tall. We're too short. We're too wide. We're not wide enough. We have the wrong phone. We don't have a phone. We drive the wrong car. We don't have a car. We live in the wrong part of the neighborhood. We live in the wrong part of town, whatever it is. Would you please remember when you look in the mirror that that's not the way the Lord sees you? Okay, so that part of this commentary is meant to warn members that there are entities out there, and he's saying it's commercials and stuff, that will tell you that there's something broken, wrong, or missing about you. And they use it to sell you a product. They use it to make you feel like now you need some way of fulfillment and that they're they're going to provide it for you. But it's going to take something from you. In the, in the case of selling something, you've got to give them money and so that you can purchase it. But it's also that these people who are using this form of manipulation can extract resources from you or extract devotion or time or whatever you want to paraphrase it as. Now, he does that. He points out something very true, but then he disguises the fact that the church actually does this. He tells people to think about how the church frames your identity and your existence relation to God. And in the church, that means that you are deferential and dependent upon the church and its leaders who are a proxy for what they tell you God wants. And it keeps you in that bind by pointing it out in somebody else so that you don't realize it's actually them that are doing it. But a talk like uh, this one from President Nelson, where he calls people who don't conform to the demands and expectations of the church lazy learners and lax disciples, and then further demonizes them as saying that they can't even muster a particle of faith because that's the you know that's how you validate and justify your spiritual existence as a Mormon. Then he's doing the exact same type of manipulation. He's creating manufactured dependence through indoctrination. It's just that, and they know it works because they he's pointed it out and warning people. But, you know, that's a classic con man move is you point out other con things because it it instills a sense of trust in your target because they're going to say, well, if he knows that this is bad and he's pointed out in other people to warn me, then he loves me and he's trying to protect me and I can trust him. And so it creates this aura of trust between the person who's warned you. But that makes you vulnerable to the very manipulation that he's pointing out. Anyway, that's that's my spiel on that. No, that's a great, great example. I will tell you that I tend to think that's a lot of times people cannot see, I know it's true with me, it's probably true with everyone, that it's difficult for them to see the faults they find in others, even if they have the same fault. What it was, was it James, John, Greenleaf, Whittier, um, this is something my mom always used to quote to me, and I better remember it. Um, Search thyself for what troubleth thee in others may in thine own heart be. I remember it. <laughs> you, okay. It's, so, it's kind of like the, uh, yeah, before you point remember. out the moat in somebody's eye, check out the beam in your own eye. Yeah, it's just a human uh, thing that frequently what pisses us off about other people is the things that we do ourselves for some reason. Anyway, anyway, yeah, I think that's great because what he's saying, I think, effectively is God doesn't care how fat you are, how skinny you are, how tall you are, or how short you are. God just cares about uh, if you're studying the things we tell you to study and if you're doing the things we tell you to do. That's all God cares about, really. Okay. I think that was a great, great um, clip you got there. I think that's fantastic, this idea you have. I'd never heard of this before, about going to YouTube and clicking state conferences and then going to the last speaker and finding out where the apostles and other GAs are going and what they're saying. Well, that's how you're going to find stuff. So the, every once in a while, you'll see like random general authority clips from like local stuff show up on the Thoughts on Things and Stuff YouTube channel. And it's usually through a process like that. Yeah, I'm sorry they didn't broadcast the Boise Rescue, but maybe they had reasons yeah. for not doing that. I don't know. Maybe they didn't have the technology. Yeah, Fortunately, we weren't so addicted okay. to Zoom back then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, timestamp 7.40. We're going to learn a little bit more about moving mountains metaphorical mountains yes all right let's hit it moving your mountains may require a miracle learn about miracles miracles come according to your faith in the lord central to that faith is trusting his will and timetable how and when 
He will bless you with the miraculous help you desire. Only your unbelief will keep God from blessing you with miracles to move the mountains in your life. There you go. Oh, so boy. what was implicit before now becomes explicit, doesn't it, Jonathan? Yeah, absolutely. Only your unbelief will keep God from blessing you with miracles to move the mountains in your life, which means if you don't get the miracle to move that metaphorical mountain in your life, if your problem is not solved, if your need is not met, if your prayer is not answered, well, whose fault is it? It's yours. This is a, such a, this is classic, crystalline, pure, unadulterated blame shifting. And I mean, you just think about it. If you want to understand what this paradigm that is. Something other than blame shifting, though it would have the same initials. <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if as a Mormon, you understand, you want to understand what we're talking about. Just, you know, let's let's displace it from Mormonism. Let's go to Scientology. There's this idea in Scientology that all the negativity in your life, whether it's your depression, your anxiety, bad things that happen to you, they're the result of these forces, these thetans that are infesting your body, affecting your thought processes and everything. And by doing the Scientology things, going to audit sessions where you hold on to the cylinders and they ask you questions and you process and you do all of the Scientology stuff, well, those thetans are going to leave you and you're going to find that that negative aspect of your life and experience is going to go away. It's going to work. They're giving you healing by telling, explaining, and giving you the prescription. So you go and you do all of the things and then the, then you still have negative things happen in your life. You still have anxiety. You still have depression. Why is this not working? And then they tell you, well, only your unbelief or your failure to do the things that you're supposed to do is going to keep withholding you from all of the blessings of having these thetans removed from your life. And so it's really your fault. It's not, definitely not, that our whole paradigm of what's wrong with you and how to fix it is completely made up and bent on subjugating you to our religious authority. It's your fault. And so, you know, Mormons looking at Scientology would be like, yeah, that's ridiculous. They're so manipulative and psychologically manipulative. I can't believe anyone would fall for that. But then you look at a talk like this and it's like, this is the same thing. You know, this is just, it's using language and themes that you're more familiar with. It's using belief, God, blessings, rather than auditing and thetans and, you know, clear and the things that are the terminology of Scientology. But, you know, the fact that this, this you know, before there's just kind of like, there's this question mark, is it that, you know, it's not God's will, or is it that you are just, you know, you're not cutting it, you're not cutting the mustard. Uh, and in this case, it's like, no, 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 the only thing, like, you know, if he just doesn't put the word only in it, but he puts the only thing that's going to prevent you from these blessings is your unbelief. That is a form of just, you know, very strict religious dogmatism that uh, is not a healing message. It's not a message that acknowledges the the difficulties and unpredictabilities of life. And it doesn't even draw upon the themes that other religious leaders use where they say sometimes God, you know, it, there's lessons to be learned in not having your blessings. Like there's this whole theme that you'll hear in wider Christian circles of thank God for unanswered prayers. And the theme of that is that sometimes the things that we want in the moment are not actually what's best for us in the long term. And you can trust a loving God and Heavenly Father to see that and to trust your strength to get through whatever's coming because you're going to learn and build from that strength. He doesn't even allow for that paradigm here because if you're not getting those blessings, it's your unbelief. And uh, anyway, it's just that's, you know, that's the Mormonism that we have in the modern era. Right. It's um, drawing on the powers of heaven type thing. And for those of you, does everybody know what that is? That was a book that was very popular 40 years ago. Grant Von Harrison, I think, wrote it. And the whole idea was if you do everything you're supposed to do as a missionary, then God has to, must, will bless you with investigators, converts, baptisms, which is the currency in missions. But you know something, if we take this one paragraph, Jonathan, so if we do everything we're supposed to do, if we study everything we're supposed to study, if we are all in, if we do the work necessary to have this faith, to move those mountains, then does that mean the mountains will be moved? Uh, according to this paradigm, yes, if you do everything and if the mountains aren't moved, if these metaphorical mountains aren't moved, it's nobody's fault but your own. 
Yeah, I know. But look at what he says right before it. Miracles come according to your faith in the Lord. Central to that faith, Jonathan, is trusting his will and time table. Oh, okay. I got you. Okay. The time oh, table yeah. element. There's, That's there's the, always the fail safe, the escape pod. The loophole. <laughs> how and when, how and when he will bless you with the miraculous help you desire. So if you're doing everything you want to do, uh, you're supposed to do, excuse me, you will get these blessings. Absolutely. Those mountains will be moved. It just may not be now or tomorrow right. or maybe even until after you die, but they will be moved. Well, you know, maybe this serves as is somewhat of a... Uh... Uh, salvage of his message so that people who, you know, you and I have probably encountered people who they are so devoted and so trusting of these men that they will put every other priority on the back burner and hunker down and do every religious demand and expectation of them. And they will devote their lives completely and absolutely. They'll, they'll you know, sacrifice any other priority that they or their family has to try to achieve these things. In many cases, if you get someone who has this form of religious scrupulosity and they also have really serious trials, you know, a disabled loved one or financial issues or anything, so they're already hurting. And now they hurt themselves even more to try to find this measure of healing and it doesn't come. Well, then he can say, well, it's not the Lord's timetable that it come right now. But right. you know, you, you're never allowed to say, well, wait a second, this whole paradigm that you're telling me is the God's reality isn't actually rooted in any authority, legitimate authority for you to proclaim those things. And so it's all just a system to get people to further rely and depend on be, and be subordinate to the leaders. It is important to make the system unfalsifiable. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, how many times have you heard somebody go up in church, usually in fast and testimony meeting? But in other venues and say, God always answers my prayers, even when the answer is no. Is no. Yeah. How many times have you heard that? Have you ever heard that? Is it just me? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I thought that was a nice thing to hear until I started thinking about it for three seconds. And I realized that what was actually being communicated, or at least the way I was hearing it, was mm -hmm. God always answers my prayers, even when he doesn't. Well, and the thing is that this this paradigm is really, really useful for any man claiming to speak for God or claiming to be a prophet. Just look at let's look at Wayne Bent or David Koresh or any other guy who's come out and said, I am God's spokesman. And so now we don't have a reason to be motivated to believe him or anything. And he says, you know, if you do what I say, God's going to bless you. But if he doesn't bless you, it's because it's God's timetable. So you need to keep doing what I say then you realize mm -hmm. if you buy that, you're never going to get out from under his spell. And you're going to just put yourself in his, uh, you know, enclave of manipulated people. And you're never going to have the tools that you need to get out of it. You have to really, if there are no tools that you're allowed to apply to your current, you know, religious paradigm, that you, you know, you, you if you applied it to any other paradigm, it would totally impeach them. You just have to realize there's something wrong with the paradigm that you're in. You have to be able to use the strength of falsifiability to validate whether claims, religious claims are true. What's the famous saying about the rat in the maze, Jonathan? A rat in the maze is free to go wherever he wants, as long as he stays in the maze. In the maze, exactly. Now, can we go to timestamp right. 8.41? It's just a little bit further on. He's going to talk about second because he's giving a list of different things to do to increase yeah. your faith and this is the second one in his list so when he starts with second that's why he's starting with that word and here's where he's going to talk about choosing to believe in christ and why it is you should do it and why it is you shouldn't do it this is another okay. one of those money quotes second choose to believe in jesus christ if you have doubts about God the Father and His beloved Son, or the validity of the Restoration, or the veracity of Joseph Smith's divine calling as a prophet, choose to believe and stay faithful. Got really there. Take your questions to the Lord and to other faithful sources. Study with a desire to believe 
rather than with the hope that you can find a flaw in the fabric of a prophet's life or a discrepancy in the scriptures. Stop increasing your doubts by rehearsing them with other doubters. Allow the Lord to lead you on your journey of spiritual discovery. Well, there he is. There he is. So this is another money quote. There's so many things to say, and I don't want to belabor the points. I will comment first off that not only, excuse me, he's gone now from telling us what to study to telling us how to study. We go to faithful sources, only faithful sources, and to the Lord, of course, who will only give revelation that supports the leadership of the church, because if it doesn't support the leaders of the church, it's not from God. There's another double bind on the side there. But we also have to study. Let me go back to this quote. Excuse me. Here it is. Um, study with the yeah, desire, to study believe. The desire to believe. That's how we have to study. So we're restricting the sources and directing us as to what the end goal must be. We must study to believe. We must choose to believe in Jesus Christ. And we have to study to believe. And we cannot be studying with the hope. I don't know anybody who really has that hope. Maybe, I don't know, anti-Mormons or something, but not people who are in the church, which presumably would be the people he's addressing in general conference. I don't think yeah. they're studying with the desire or the hope that they can find a flaw in the fabric of a prophet's life i.e. Joseph Smith marrying 14-year-old girls, okay? I don't think people hope that they can find that. I think they're quite distressed when they find it. At least that's what I understand uh, other people who are members of the church usually experience when they find out about that and other things. And they don't generally study in order to hope they'll find a discrepancy in the scriptures. But sometimes they do. Sometimes they do, even without that hope. And I think that this talk completely circumvents that entire scenario, which is what more and more members of the church are finding. So the first strategy is keep them away from that stuff. Look, only go to faithful sources. Don't try and find uh, flaws in prophets. Don't try and find flaws in the scriptures. So basically, if those things should come up, really don't even worry about them, okay? Just keep yeah. choosing to believe in Jesus Christ. And of course, by choosing to believe in Jesus Christ, he means choosing to believe in the validity of the restoration. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, you make some excellent points there. Um, he starts out by rooting things in, in wider conventional religious terms, things that the broader Christian world would believe in. So we'd say, you know, if you have doubts about God, Jesus, the beloved son, okay, but then he tosses in Joseph and the restoration in that. So now people who find themselves trapped in a high demand, totalistic form of Mormonism are told that this is the way that all other churches are, and this is the religious paradigm that exists everywhere else. And so if you're going to give up Joseph Smith, you have to give up God and Jesus Christ and everybody else. You just throw it all out, and you don't want to do that, so you choose to believe, because if you impeach Joseph Smith, then you're impeaching God and Christ as well. But the thing is that betrays the fact that there are a lot of people who wake up to the fraud of Joseph Smith and then go out and realize that the wider religious world is not as high-demand uh, you know, works con condemning total totalistic hierarchy-based religion. There are religions out there that do give people spiritual autonomy and a framework to develop and foster their own spiritual development without a hierarchy of authority caging them in. There are religious frameworks out there for that, but this scares people away from even wondering that because if you throw Joseph Smith away, you have to throw all religion away. And that's not necessarily true. It's true for some people. And I think particularly when you come out of an authoritarian hierarchical religion like this, you become very resistant to be a joiner of any other particular religious group. But he's doing that. And you see that happen a lot of times where in Fair Mormon or I think in your discussion with Quake UL, and even this whole concept is if you leave the church, well, where you will, where you will go. It's using fear, uncertainty, and doubt to get people to stay attached to the church. But this idea that you point out where, you know, you, myself, other people, when we started to learn about church history, we didn't 
take the approach of I'm going to find a problem. I'm going to find a problem. It's we stumbled across a problem. Or I mean, the thing that happened again and again and again is I would hear something bad and I'd say that's impossible. There's no way that a prophet of God would do that. There's no way that God would condone it. And then you do the research and you realize, wait a second, this did happen. Things that Sandra Tanner said were, were true. You know, all of the, the, the anti-Mormon lies were actually true. You, you have to struggle with that realization. You have to find a way. And we all go through the, you don't immediately be like, well, you know, he boinked a 14 year old. Maybe he didn't boink it, but he, he cloistered a 14 year old. Well, I'm done. I'm gone. You know, it's not that simple. It's like, wow, I, I don't understand that. But you learn more and more. And soon a pattern starts to emerge. You start to realize that the pattern of fraud, deception, abuse of authority, abuse of power that you would identify and condemn in any other organized crime syndicate, any other, you know, false religious authority paradigm is displayed in great detail in the history of Mormonism. And when you start to come to that realization, now it's not that you're trying to find the fabric of a flaw or the flaw in the fabric of a prophet's life. It's you're just, you're no longer surprised that things that he does are indistinguishable from things that other con religious con artists do or other sexual predators using the paradigm of religion do. It's just like, oh, okay. And so that you, you've, you've lost, the thing is, this segment of his talk shows that they have misdiagnosed the problem. They think that the problem is that there's a bunch of cynical members who are just trying to find problems in everything. And all we've got to do is we've got to uh, make cynicism and fault finding the demon. And they don't realize the problem is the reality of the history of the church and the character of its founder are the problem. And... Coming to terms with that is an existential crisis for the church. It's not impossible. You know, you can look at the community of Christ. They paid a price in terms of the number of members, the devotion of their members, their ability to retain their youth, because those things are pretty low. But they've come to terms with a great deal of the, the difficulties that are causing problems here. And so they no longer hold Joseph Smith in the same position of reverence that they used to in terms of religious spiritual reverence. There's still a tradition reverence in terms of their community. But it's different. So, you know, if you don't diagnose the problem correctly, you're not going to fix it. And in some instances, you may actually exacerbate it. And that is the road that he is going down here. And we're seeing it by him just diving into the same sort of milieu control. Because when you look at any other high demand religion and they say, don't go to any sources that we haven't told you that you can trust, what they're doing is they're cutting off your ability to learn and gather knowledge from sources other than sources that they control, which means that you are subject only to propaganda that they have the ability to shape and form and target towards your brain. And if you want to get out of a system that is shaped and formed by propaganda in this form of milieu control, you have to look at sources outside of it. That's why you want to go to a third party review for a car that you're going to buy or a house you're going to buy. That's why you need an independent investigation into whatever, you know, critical thing that you want to make sure is sure. You know, if you if you're an investor and Bernie Madoff comes and tells you, you know, I'm going to do I'm going to totally grow your investment all that you've saved in your life is for uh, you know, you want an independent audit of Bernie Madoff to do that. You need outside information because there were whistleblowers. There were people who studied Bernie Madoff and then came to the investors and said, he is scamming you. The numbers don't add up. And the message from Bernie Madoff was, you know, there are people who are really jealous of our success and they're just trying to draw our clients away because they want to gain the profit. And, you know, they don't have the algorithms that we have. So you just have to realize those people have their own motivations and ignore them. Stay with the information we provide you. And he provided people with quarterly reports, financial summaries, all this information. But because there was that milieu control where you demonize any doubt, demonize any criticism, people kept their investment in that system and they lost big in the end. So when you see that pattern, that's a red flag and he's, he's waving it in spades here. Yeah. And this paragraph was especially pregnant. Uh, if you are not studying the scriptures, right? If you're studying with the desire to believe, you're not trying to find a problem with a prior prophet. Gosh, all these P's. I'm starting to sound like I should be in general conference. A problem with a prior prophet or even with the, the speaking prophet, right, President Nelson, or a discrepancy in the scriptures. But if you should find one, all right, you're not trying to find one. If you should find one and it causes you a doubt, 
Then he addresses that as well in the next sentence when he says, stop increasing your doubts by rehearsing them with other doubters. And when he says that, I understand what he's saying, and it makes a certain degree of sense, I think, that, of course, if you rehearse something, then it will, well, it'll become more memorized, more a part of you, like if you rehearse for a show or anything like that, right? You're rehearsing your lines in order to try and remember them, right? So it embeds it more, rehearsing, repetition. Um, but on the other hand, I kind of hear him saying, if you have doubts, don't talk about them with anybody else. Do you yeah, get that impression too? Absolutely. That I think that is one of the strongest themes in this thing uh, in terms of stop. This is a very directive command from the prophet. Stop increasing your doubts by rehearsing them with other doubters. Don't get together and talk with other people who may be struggling with, you know, wanting to believe the, the facts of church history. Um, the idea, though, that it's the rehearsal of those things that cause people to doubt rather than the reality of what those things depict and the conclusions that you draw from them. And it's another example of kind of missing the point of what the problem actually is. But he's pointing you towards that sort of manipulation and milieu control, which is censor yourself. If you do have questions, don't share them with other people. Don't explore them. Choose to believe. Shut down the part of your mind that has a problem with that and go back and you know, read scriptures with the intent to believe. It's kind of like, you know, if you're doing an experiment and you find, you start out with a hypothesis and you find some data that supports that hypothesis. And then you find some data that contradicts the hypothesis. He's saying, ignore the data that contradicts the hypothesis. Only look at the data that supports the hypothesis. But the thing is, it's that contradictory data that establishes whether or not the hypothesis is true. This is the Karl Popper's principle of falsifiability that you have to have. You don't establish the truth of something by looking only at data that supports your hypothesis. You establish the truth of something by challenging its assertion, challenging the hypothesis with something which could prove it to be false if your hypothesis was false. And if it survives that challenge, then you've it's increased the likelihood that it's true. But if your ability to falsify it impeaches it and says, well, actually, that hypothesis is contradicted by this negative data, then that's actually how you learn. That's how you learn to distinguish something that's true from something that's false. And he's just telling you, don't go through that process. Don't do it with other people. And it's another thing that further serves to separate people from their loved ones who may be doubting. You know, if I want to now talk with my brothers about the problem that I have in this, well, my brothers have been warned about uh, rehearsing doubts. So even if they have minor questions because they've been a little bit troubled by some of the things they've heard me say, they're not going to talk to me anymore because the prophet has warned them against doing that. And so there's now further separation with myself and, and my brothers, but it's based on the words that come out of this man's mouth. Hmm. Well, this is the Mormon version of the don't ask, don't tell policy. We're not supposed to ask about doubts we have. We're not supposed to tell people about doubts that we have. And I do see it, I agree with you, as this quarantining maneuver and this mm. isolation of the individual who has doubts. And I will tell you that I can see it as something that he wants to have done. But from my point of view and from the point of view of a lot of others, here's what happens. We end up studying. We end up thinking. We end up uh, being a lazy learner and finding things that trouble us, that we have doubts about, that we have questions about. And we don't want to share it with other people. And we're told not to share it with other people. And we end up thinking, thinking we're the only ones. I mean, how long did I think that about myself, really? Looking around in a ward or in a stake. I'm the only one who has these questions. I'm the only one who has these doubts. And as long as I'm not allowed to talk about them and find out that actually I'm not the only one with these doubts, I'm not alone. There are actually a lot of people out there. And then if you broaden that from the ward and stake to the entire world via the Internet, like we're doing now here in Texas, I'm in Washington. I don't know where everybody lives who's watching this, but all of a sudden it's liberating. It's freeing. It is. Well, how does it feel when you've been in prison for a long time and you finally get out? It's liberating to find out that you're not the only one. You're not alone. 
And everybody who's watching this, you and I are violating this directive from the president right now because we're rehearsing our doubts with each other. And mm -hmm. in a way, everybody who's watching this is also in a way violating that, uh, even if they're not actually participating. But by listening to us, they're rehearsing their doubts. So now there's that's a dimension of this. Go ahead, finish your thought. Oh, sorry, I'm saying this is what President Nelson wants. But for many people, maybe all people, it's liberating. I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. Are you Absolutely. getting a phone call right now? Is President no, no, Nelson just, on? <laughs> no. Um, you know, you're, you're spot on in terms of that that experience that we all have where we're learning these things, we're, we're realizing, wait, is it not true? And you feel alone and isolated. And he's serving to make sure that isolation stays. Because if you if you feel you're alone, then you start to get the sense, well, maybe it's it's it's, it's me. It's the problems with me. You know, there's this classic social experiment where they would bring in one person and then he'd sit in a panel of five other people. And all five other people are actually also on the research team, but he doesn't know it. He thinks they're also volunteers. And then they show them two lines. One is shorter than the other. And he says, are these the same length? And they'll ask all the other cohorts or confederates, the people who are in on it, to tell. And then some of them may say yes or no. And they'll start out and it'll, you know, everyone acknowledges the conventional thing. Oh, yeah, that one's shorter. That one's the same or whatever. And he'll answer two and everyone is the same. And then they'll do an experiment where one the lines are exactly the same. And then they'll ask all the other confederates first. And each of them will say, well, line B is shorter. And then... The guy at the end is like, well, everyone else sees it as shorter. I'm the only one that sees it as the same. Uh, I guess they're probably right, so I'm just going to agree with them. And so statistically, that last person is more likely to agree with the other people because he then starts to question his own faculties, his own vision, his own judgment. And they'll find that even when it's something where maybe you know, if the lines are the same, maybe one's slightly shorter than the other, but even if when there was one line that was remarkably shorter than the other, if everyone else said that that other line, you know, the short one was actually longer or the same, in a significant fraction of the people who were the actual targets of the study, they would go along with the rest of the crowd because they felt like maybe there was something wrong with them, whether they didn't understand the question or whatever, but they didn't want to appear to step out of line. So that same psychological phenomenon is the same thing that happens when you feel like you're alone. Everybody else believes, well, something must be wrong with you. And he's just telling people to stay in that protective shell of, you know, n feeling like you can't trust your own judgment because everybody else is going along with it. You know, there's this idea that courage is contagious and, and, that is said frequently in the political realm, courage to stand up and to speak truth to power or to say something that contradicts a dominant narrative can be contagious because it allows other people to see that they're not alone. Other people to see that there's a pattern of standing up to you know, authority that is illegitimate and abusive and it gives them the strength to do it too. And, and I think the more people are given the ability to, to voice their doubts, to voice their concerns, um, the more we're going to see it. You know, if you want to talk about a stone that is rolling down a hill and gathering momentum, you know, there's a paradigm for that. But there's an aspect to this that I do want to talk about and get your thoughts on. And that is that you and I are talking about criticism of the leaders, criticism of the church from a perspective that sees their authority as illegitimate from the beginning. There are people that he could be targeting who are discussing their doubts about current church leaders, current manifestation of the church, who are saying, you know, Denver Snuffer has some really good points. And when you look at the scripture of the church, the things that the leaders are doing right now, totally befied it. So now we've got doubt, criticism, cynicism about the current leaders of the church. And, and so the question comes, how do you, just, what's the difference between these two paradigms? You know, you and I criticizing the foundational claims of the church versus someone following Denver Snuffer or another breakoff who are criticizing the current manifestation of the church by contrasting it with the early scripture and teachings of early church leaders, whether it's the FLDS or Denver Snuffer or anything like that. All of those things have a form of criticism that's trying to separate people from the current leadership. How do, how, you know, what is the difference? What do you think? What is the difference? Well, I think the difference um, can be summarized in this saying by somebody, it's actually me, I'll be quoting myself here for a second, is the difference between Joseph Smith and early Mormonism, as we read about it in church history, as we read about it in the Doctrine and Covenants, et cetera, and today's leadership 
is vast. There's a huge difference between the two. And yet, perforce, the leaders of today's church have to act as if they are not just part of the same tradition, but have the same authority because they claim to have the same keys, the same titles of prophet, seer, and revelator, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the saying is that if Joseph Smith was not a prophet, then President Nelson is not a prophet because his authority rests on Joseph Smith. But from another perspective, if Joseph Smith was a prophet, then President Nelson is obviously not a prophet yeah, because he's so different from Joseph Smith. They're in this double bind. So that's part of the difference that I see here. I don't know if that gets directly to your point, but I think that what it is has to do with this talk and also Elder Rasman's talk, which I don't think we're ever going to get to today. So we'll have to do another session, but this is definitely worth spending time on because this is in the context of a miracle talk. Mm. Remember, he's talking about learn about miracles. You need miracles. Yeah. The miracles are to move the metaphorical mountains in your life. So this is all about miracles because they understand they have to have miracles in order to be the true church. The problem is they just don't have any. They seem to be in short supply. And therefore, they come up with all these stories, which they call miracles, which if you're just going to take their word for it and not think about it, okay, we've still got miracles. But more and more people are looking at those stories and saying, this is nothing but a coincidence. This is not a miracle. And even when the miracles happen, the person dies anyway. And the miracle is that peace fills the room. And even though the priesthood blessing doesn't work. And I think that there are two different groups of people. There's people like you and me who probably look at that as a situation where, because we're looking at the foundation of the church is problematic and probably the miracle stories there didn't happen because there's really no miracle story that you can find in early church history, except that upon closer examination, it starts falling apart. And it starts not being as strong as it appears to be. But then there's other people, and I know some people, and I'm related to some people, who look at Joseph Smith and the early Mormonism, believe that that's true, see that today is in apostasy because they don't have the signs, they don't have the miracles, and are therefore looking for somebody to come and restore the church the way it was in Joseph Smith's day. Well, it's not President Nelson. He talks the talk, but he doesn't walk the walk. That's the problem yep. with the modern leaders. And so enter from stage right Denver Snuffer, yep. who claims to have these same kind of miracles, these same kind of visionary experiences, these same kind of translation experiences and giving us new scripture experiences. And he's a restorationist movement of the restoration. <laughs> and so that becomes very appealing to people who do believe mm -hmm in the miracles that happened early on and don't see them today. I've talked a lot. Have I gotten anywhere near close to addressing your no, question? I think you you targeted in on the exact same thing. And, and what I want to point out is that President Nelson gives us the key to how to understand this thing. And he does it with one line. I'm going to replay it. It's the last line of that clip. And it points to exactly what you're talking about. So let's take a look here. Allow the Lord to lead you on your journey of spiritual discovery. So allow the Lord to lead you on your journey of spiritual discovery. And what he's saying, when he when a, when the prophet of the Mormon church says, allow the Lord to lead you, what he's saying is, allow me as the mouthpiece of God to tell you where it's safe to learn things, to show you what conclusions are safe to draw. And if you have any conclusions that are apart from what I'm telling you, you should conclude, then you're stepping outside of the leadership of the Lord, i.e. the leadership of me. So now let's go to the Denver Snuffer followers. This same principle applies. Allow the Lord to lead you. So in their paradigm, the Lord is the voice of God as expressed through their trusted spiritual figures, of which Denver Snuffer is the most prominent one. Now, they also have the concept that you can get personal revelation, but that is always subordinate to the broader revelation of their spiritual leader in the form of Denver Snuffer. 
and any other religious paradigm, this Lord figure, the person who's going to direct you, is the one that's telling you what things you can believe, what things you can trust, and what things you can't. But it's always done through authority where they tell you. It's not through empowering and enabling you to draw your own conclusions. Now, the approach that is different from the way that we frame things and the way that you'll find many people framing things is that you don't trust religious authority. You trust logic, reason, rationality, judgment that you maintain yourself. That doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect, but it means that if you do find an error in your judgment, an error in the way of your thinking, you correct it without waiting for permission for from some authority to correct it. And that's a way that you, you could imagine, you know, if you were talking about Bernie Madoff and the financial scam, if he says, you know, allow me as your financial advisor to guide you on your spirit, on your discovery of how to judge a financial advisor, you'd say, well, hold on, hold on a second. No, 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 no. We need somebody else to tell me how to judge those things. But that's what he's telling you to do. So that paradigm keeps people trapped in manipulation. And, and the approach that I know that you and Bill Real and I try to take is to – Empower yourself, empower your own judgment, empower your conscience, free of these types of manipulations to come to your own conclusions. And, and the goal here is not to tell you to, dis, you know, to disbelieve the church because you believe me. The goal is these are facts that we found. These are principles of ethics, um, non-proprietary morality, uh, rationality that you can apply to the, what you learn from the church and come to your own judgment as to what it is. You don't have to follow me. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to use the same conclusions that I make for impeaching the authority of current and past leaders of the church. That's up to you. And um, and, and so that, I think that's the paradigm. It, it comes from, are you just going to go from one set of propaganda and manipulation to another? Because every paradigm is going to give you the tools that you would need to uh, throw over, you know, the other guy and then follow them. And you have to follow them. And so whether it's Chris Namelka, whether it's Denver Snuffer, whether it's Warren Jeffs or anyone else, the, the whole thing is, yeah, don't follow the Mormon church. Those prophets are bunk, but then you got to follow me. And that's it's, it can be really hard when you've been raised in a framework of spiritual dependence where you don't trust yourself. And there always has to be this figurehead that gives you the comfort and security of knowing what is what, what is right, what is wrong, how to judge things. And you're always dependent on them. And it, it's scary to start to trust yourself. But the process, the reason I say that when you leave the church, you do have to go through this process of learning manipulation, learning the history, is because you're building up your own internal strength to be able to judge these things because the Mormon church is not the only manipulative force out there. And religion is not the only manipulative force out there. You're going to encounter social movements, political movements, other things in your life that are going to try to use the same tactics to get you dependent upon them for you to, you know, shape your own identity or shape the worldview. And so that's kind of my spiel on that. Yeah, I think uh, that very much the process of growth is learning to trust ourselves, to take that locus of authority from outside mm -hmm. us and to bring it inside of us. And now that you mention it, I do hear many of the words being used here and in other talks and indeed throughout the LDS church as an exercise in teaching us to not trust yeah. ourselves, to trust them. You can trust yourself as long as you're trusting them, right? But right. you can't trust yourself if it should be anything that doesn't trust the leaders of the church, which basically yeah. means don't trust yourself, right? Just the same yeah. way about revelation. You can receive whatever re revelation you want as long as it is the same revelation as we receive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So that's part of the double speak going on. And when President Nelson ends with that quote you played again, allow the Lord to lead you on your journey of spiritual discovery. Mm -hmm. That's what I feel I've done. Well, see, that's, I think people in that paradigm, when they start to say that the Lord has led them away from Mormonism, what they're doing is they're starting to develop a concept of the Lord, a concept of God, a concept of spirituality that is independent of what the Mormon church tells them that they've done. And for some people, that is a shifting idea. And I've spoken to people who the concept of the Lord and God and the divine started out as something external, but the more that they learned about themselves, they learned about the history of religion and everything, it started to become something more internal. And things that they used to attribute to religious authority, they now granted themselves as their own independent authority. And some people abandon the idea of re religion and God altogether, and they start to root their authority in their sense of self and their own autonomy. And there's something that is... 
um, healing about doing that, whether or not you're in, you know, I think you have to do that to some extent, because when you do, if you stay religious, and you go to some other religious paradigm, you need that sense of self, that strength of your inner um, autonomy, so that when you encounter other types of manipulation and deception, you can uh, protect yourself from them, because they're definitely out there. I think that for a lot of people, as long as we're going down this fascinating uh, avenue of thought, Jonathan, I think there are a lot of people who believe that the leaders of the church do speak for God and therefore they trust them. I mean, President Nelson told everybody prophets teach the truth. You can trust us, as Elder Ballard said. In fact, you just trust us. Remember what he said? We're as transparent as we know how to be. Just trust us. You tell your friends that uh, nobody's ever hidden anything in this church. But I think that there are times and moments when the facts break into that worldview. And I know this, this happened to me. I think these are the kinds of things that gave me the ability to start trusting myself was when I started realizing that the leaders of the church don't necessarily speak for God. They are not the doctrinally inerrant oracles that they proclaim themselves to be. And whether it's blacks in the priesthood and the reversal of that in 1978 and studying what Brigham Young said about it versus what Spencer Kimball said about it, then you start going, wait a second, here's a problem. But even more dramatically and even more recent is the 2015 policy of exclusion, which President Nelson, who was not president at the time, except of the Quorum of the Twelve, I guess, in January of 2016, proclaimed to be revelation. And he didn't just say it was a revelation. He described the entire proceeding where everybody was present. They saw the spirit move upon President Monson. It was their privilege to confirm the voice and the will of the Lord. And then three and a half years later, it's reversed. And once again, it's being proclaimed to be revelation. So revelation for the imposition of this abominable policy of exclusion. And yes, I did say abominable. And then three and a half years later, they reverse it. And they also do it by revelation. And that was jarring for a lot of people. And I, I don't know if I was past being jarred at that point, but it was somewhat unusual because the priesthood ban took 125 years plus maybe three. Uh, it took 125 years or so for that to get reversed. And that's a long time. And people live and die in that time. There is no cultural memory of what it was like before. You just have to read it in the history books. But when you look yeah. at three and a half years and you're there and it causes this huge hubbub and people are resigning in mass at Temple Square over this policy in 2015, the three and a half years they reverse it and it's both by revelation and people start thinking, I am really, really wondering now if you guys speak for God in this because did you guys change your mind or did God change his mind in three and a half years? Did God really not know what he was doing to such an extent that he revealed this policy to you only to have to reverse it three and a half years later? And once you have the door cracked open that much, that's Pandora's box. If you conclude that on one of these occasions, either 2015 or three and a half years later in 2019, I think it was, on one of those occasions, they're not speaking for God, right? Okay. If on one of those occasions, maybe both, if on one of those occasions, they're not speaking for God, which seems to be almost inevitable as a conclusion, mm -hmm. then when else are they not speaking for God? And if there are times when they don't speak for God, then maybe trusting them that everything they say comes from God is not the best course and maybe I need to start listening to what the Holy Ghost tells me in addition to, and even when it's at variance with what the leaders of the church are saying. Yeah. And then comes the realization that what you were told was the Holy Ghost was your conscience and the sense, the sense of cognitive dissonance. And so when you encounter things that resonate with your own sense of goodness, represent rep reciprocity and, and justice. I know. And justice, then you're going to feel some 
emotional resonance with that and that's going to be good and when you when things don't you know they don't mesh up then you're not going to feel that and and it's a different way to frame that experience but i thought that you and uh, Stephen wright did a uh, or spencer wright did a brilliant job of explaining the difference between an experience that you might have and then uh, objective data or what you attribute to that you get, there was a distinction that i'll refer people to that conversation on your last episode of mormonism live okay well do we want to move to timestamp 1158 Yes, I was just checking. It is John Greenleaf Whittier. Wanted to make sure about that for my mom's sake. Uh, not that I wasn't paying absolute attention to what you were saying. By the way, it's going to be a miracle if we get done with this one talk in two hours. Yeah, we're but you got to spend the time on the big guns, you know. You do, and we'll have to have another episode on the other, the last session, because we're not going to get okay. there I can today. go back. I could change the title. I can change the logo. We'll, we'll retrofit it to make it work. You're going to change the logo. Well, the okay. thumbnail. Okay, got it, says, it, got it. It says final session. All right. So uh, should we continue? Timestamp 1158. Yes. Now, this is going to be a long story. It's not that long, but it's a story. And this is a story about uh, faith, faith to um, stop the rain, right, when he's traveling to the South Pacific. Oh, to yeah. Visit the saints back when he could do that. So there's faith that some of the saints have to stop the rain, but then the, there's other saints who don't have the faith to stop the rain. But their faith is greater than the faith of those who stop the rain. And Let's it's so appropriate how we, that this comes what? right after he said, learn about miracles. And now I'm going to teach you about miracles. Yes. And once again, as you're listening to this, think about this with the backdrop, because I continue to believe that even with his talk in the Saturday evening session, the last one, by the way, in history, apparently, where I had said before that I feel like he's trying to work out in his mind why it is that God did not answer the prayers of the saints to turn back the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I think he's continuing to work that out here. He's not going to say that's what he's doing, but I think that's what he's trying to resolve in his own mind. I mean, he's not an idiot. He's a smart man. He's a very intelligent man, and he's left with this whole situation of egg on his face, where he publicly asked the entire church and the world to pray and fast to turn the pandemic away, and it doesn't work. And so he does it again, and there's a second day of fasting and prayer, and everything just gets worse. He's got to try and deal with that and resolve it somehow in his mind. And that kind of experience can lead a person on to greater spiritual growth, I think, or it can retrench them in their old ways by finding some rhetorical way of rationalizing it that doesn't lead them to greater growth, but further embeds them where they are. And I think that's what he ends up doing. Do not minimize the faith you already have. It takes faith to join the church and remain faithful. It takes faith to follow prophets rather than pundits and popular opinion. It takes faith to serve a mission during a pandemic. It takes faith to live a chaste life when the world shouts that God's law of chastity is now outmoded. It takes faith to teach the gospel to children in a secular world. It takes faith to plead for the life of a loved one and even more faith to accept a disappointing answer. Okay, can you stop right there for a second, Jonathan? Yeah. This is key because now he's going to be taking his cue from Elder Bednar's mm -hmm. famous talk in 2013. And that wasn't in general conference, but a lower general authority repeated in general conference. He's going to key off that idea now without giving credit. Where credit is due, if credit it be. But where he says it takes faith to plead for the life of a loved one, and even more faith to accept a disappointing answer. So here he's saying the exact same thing as Elder Bednar, which is that it takes faith to be healed, but it takes greater faith to not be healed. Remember his, his question, yeah. do you have the faith not, not to, to be healed? healed? And now this is what he's applying it to. Now I'm doing some mind reading here. Okay. And I apologize. This is speculation on my part. I read it, readily acknowledge it. 
as such. But I think that he's trying to figure out it took faith for us to plead to God to turn back the pandemic, but he didn't do it. Well, God is still God. He still has the power to do it. Those things are not going to change in the paradigm, although they could. But he's not going to go there, of course. So instead, it's not the faith of the saints. It's the fact that it takes greater faith to accept the disappointing answer that God is not going to turn back the pandemic. And now he's going to relate it to this experience he had with his wife, Wendy, visiting the Southern Pacific. Okay, so let's continue his comments. Two years ago, Sister Nelson and I visited Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, and Tahiti. Each of those island nations had experienced heavy rains for days. Members had fasted and prayed that their outdoor meetings would be protected from the rain. In Samoa, Fiji, and Tahiti, just as the meetings began, the rain stopped. But in Tonga, the rain did not stop. Yet, 13,000 faithful saints came hours early to get a seat, waited patiently through a steady downpour, and then sat through a very wet two-hour meeting. We saw vibrant faith at work in each of those, among each of those islanders. Faith sufficient to stop the rain and faith to persevere when the rain did not stop. Can you stop it there? No. By the way, I'm not seeing his his face while we're listening to it. That won't matter on oh. my podcast because my audio only. But I think the people yeah. who are watching would like to see President Nelson. Um, no. So here we get to this fascinating idea, right? Which is he goes to the South Pacific. There are huge storms, and members of the church on three of the islands they prayed just as the meetings began, and the rain stopped. It's a miracle. They had faith. But in Tonga, the rain did not stop. Presumably, the Tongan saints are praying just like the saints in the other islands, right? And yet 13,000 of those faithful Tongan saints came hours early to get a seat, and they waited patiently through a steady downpour and then sat through a very wet two-hour meeting. So what to make of that? Here we've got prayers that are answered and prayers that are not answered. Okay. If we look at it just objectively prayer, we, we, we could look at it as a coincidence too. And frankly, I think the fact that some got answered and some don't kind of speak to the coincidental nature of it, yeah. <laughs> but we yep. could look at it. Um, some had their prayers answered and some did not. Okay. Well, is that because the Tongan saints did not have as much faith as the saints on the other islands? No, because the Tongan saints didn't have faith to have their prayers answered, but they had the faith to persevere and sit through a very wet two-hour meeting in the steady downpour. So here's where I see him analogizing sub silentio, which means like it's under the surface and it's silent, right? It's not coming out and saying it. But here I hear him rationalizing why it is that God did not answer the prayers to turn away the pandemic. It wasn't the faith of the saints that was the problem. If he had turned away the pandemic, that would have been the Samoa, Fiji, and Tahiti saints, right? But the fact that Separating he didn't turn away the pandemic, the fact he didn't turn away the pandemic doesn't mean that we didn't have faith. What it means is, if we continue faithful, then we have more faith than if we had been able to get God to turn back the pandemic. Your thoughts? Well, I think what we're seeing here is the, that grand rhetorical tool of flattery, which um, <clears throat> Sherry Dew kind of, in a recent, in the women's conference, she uh, brought this up and... Um, and much like the gong thing where they understand these principles, they just kind of use them when they need to. Uh, let's see if this clip is right. From the church. 
Social media inflames all of these divisions by dishing up snippets of facts that rarely represent the whole truth and providing a forum for one of Satan's most insidious tactics, flattery. How diabolical is flattery? Look at any antichrist in the Book of Mormon or anyone seeking followers for themselves. They are always masters of flattery. Sherem is a classic example. Quote, he had a perfect knowledge of the language of the people. Wherefore, he could use much flattery and much power of speech according to the power of the devil. Close quote. Flattery is telling people what they want to hear, and it is designed for just one purpose, to get followers for yourself. So what he's doing in the mode of flattery here is he's telling the people who prayed and the rain stopped that the strength of their faith stopped the rain. And then he's telling the people who prayed and the rain didn't stop, but they sat with their butts in the seat and listened that their faith was so powerful that it inspired them to stay in the rain and sit through the whole thing. And they persevered their perseverance. And faith. he's just for both of those groups, he's telling them what they want to hear in a way that will increase their faith and continue to have them follow them. That's one facet of that message. And then the second facet is setting forth this pattern of how we can contextualize things that happen in the face of us praying for things. And by seeing him find a positive aspect in both of those scenarios, we then wanting to maintain our belief as church members, if we're in that believing mode, will look for a positive way to interpret things. If I pray and my abuela heals from COVID, then that's great. It speaks to the strength of my faith and the power of prayer, and we are bound further to the church. If I pray and my abuela passes away from COVID-19, then my ability to endure that trial is a testament to the the strength that my faith gives me and it further binds me to the church and so he this is where he's you know having it both ways and as you correctly pointed out you could almost not ask for a more perfect experiment if we were going to design an experiment to figure out whether or not prayer actually works then let's have a bunch of people in different parts of the world and we know rain is coming to both of them and it's so unpredictable even the weatherman can't predict it and we're going to have one group pray and another group pray and so it should kind of be if prayer works you know this is now you got huge masses thousands tens of thousands of people praying so if one of them is like you know he was diddling with his factory last week his prayer is not going to work well the aggregate of that many people and the faith of those people now is accounting for those you know variances in individual faith we've got an aggregate of faith and the power of that aggregate of faith on the weather is going to test whether or not faith has the power to stop the weather when you want to listen to the prophet's voice and the experiment if it was true You'd have to run it a multiple times, but uh, you know the ones where the prayer works, it's it's going to stop on both places, so they can do it. But if it's not, if the the power of that prayer doesn't actually have the power to control the weather, then you're going to find the scenario that happened here, where it it doesn't really matter. Weather just happens, and um, <laughs> but he's now giving us a caveat. He's giving us an allowance that you can use now to maintain belief and faith in that prayer despite the evidence really not supporting it. And you've pointed out other examples of this when you look at death rates and sickness rates in hospitals in Utah where there's a significant percentage of Mormons who are giving blessings for healing and you compare that to other ones, there's not really much of a difference. So that's another one of these types of tests to see if the claim of the ability to heal is actually legitimate or if it's just a delusion that the... Um, the leaders impose upon the members of the church in order to maintain their power, authority, and control. You're right. I think that while he's trying to show that greater faith is had by those who don't have their prayers answered and yet continue faithful, what he's inadvertently also demonstrating is that answers to prayer are largely a matter of coincidence. Yeah. By the way, about Sherry Dew, I saw that clip. My gosh, you know, she's changing quite a bit in, in recent years. I hadn't seen her in a while, but maybe it's, this is a matter of sour grapes, her message about flattery, because I don't think she's getting a lot. Well, you know, the ironic thing about that clip is if you go and look at it, she starts by warning about flattery and Satan's tool, and it tells people what they want to hear. And then 
in that same talk, she tells people, oh, just check out the message about the great and noble spirits because you are all the great and noble spirits. <laughs> it's like, that's a little flattery. I'm just saying. And I don't know if you want to be talking about the noble ones when we're trying to get away from what we used to talk about, the noble ones and the less noble, less valiant ones and what that implied for uh, <laughs> your time here on the earth. But uh, Right. Flattery is only bad. Oh, flattery is only bad when I'm not the one using it on you. Right. Exactly. And I don't want to be rude here, but, you know, she's starting to look like Kim Hunter from Planet of the Apes. Well, I, I am allowing a lot of leeway in coming out of COVID and trying to figure out how to be in public again. I don't know if there's bad surgery or what. But anyway, I wish you the best. I think she's a, a wonderful woman, very intelligent, and um, she dresses to the nines. I just hope she keeps talking because uh, she just keeps dropping those black pearls and <laughs> they're just so fun. Oh, one other thing here that's very important, getting back to President Nelson, if you're done with uh, Ms. Dew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so getting back to him, this is something that had occurred to me. We've got about 15 minutes left. I know you don't have to go anywhere, but I do. So in two hours is really quite enough. Don't you think at one sitting? For one talk, yeah. Yeah, so here's the deal, Okay. And now I realize this about what he's saying, which means I re realize it about what Elder Bednar was saying back in 2013. Here's what he's doing. I don't think intentionally, okay? What he's doing is a logical fallacy. And the logical fallacy that he is committing here is the fallacy of equivocation. And the fallacy of equivocation means when you're using the same word here that has one meaning, and then you're using the same word over here, but with a different meaning, but you're treating them as if they're the same thing. And this is a classic example of that. And the word, of course, is faith. Faith, if you have, there's two kinds of faith going on here. If you have faith to stop the rain, right? That's one definition of faith. And what that means is some kind of attribute that you have as a person to intercede with God to get God to do things your way or stop doing what it is he's doing that you don't want or start doing something that he's not doing that you do want, right? That's one kind of faith. The second kind of faith, though, is faithfulness, and he will use that, which means devotion, loyalty, commitment to hmm. continue doing what it is that you are expected to do regardless mm -hmm. of what it gets you, right? You're going to continue yeah. doing what's right because you are a slave to duty. Uh, Gilbert and Sullivan reference, again, Pirates of Penzance, yeah. right? That's a subtitle, the slave of duty. So you will do your duty regardless of whether things go your way or not. And in fact, if things don't go your way, then you have to be more faithful and more, more devoted to continue doing your duty. But that's the second faith. So when he says there's faith uh, of the Samoan, Fiji, and Tahiti saints. They had faith to stop the rain. But the other saints in Tonga, who did not have the faith to stop the rain, but yet continued faithful, and they went to that meeting, and they sat through the meeting two hours in a driving storm, they had greater faith than the others. But you see what he's doing here? Mm. It's not the same definition of the word faith. It is an equivocation, which once again, I don't think he's doing intentionally. I don't know that um, uh, Elder Bednar was doing it intentionally because he does the same thing. The faith to yeah. be healed and the faith to not be healed. Because when he says the faith to not be healed, as he defines it in his talk, he means the faith to continue obedient and devoted to the church in spite of the fact that your prayer was not answered in spite of the fact that you didn't have the faith to get God to do what it is that you wanted him to do. So I see this as um, a mental exercise, which ends up being an exercise in fallacious reason, reasoning because it commits the logical fallacy of equivocation. Your thoughts? Oh, I think that's a brilliant breakdown of it. I hadn't really thought of how they're using those two concepts. It's like the difference between faith as we understand it in the religious terms of uh, believing in something that you have no evidence of, but is true in terms of what they think, and then faith in terms of like, well, my wife is faithful, 
to me or something like that. You know, it's a very different concept, but he's kind of attributing that he's using the word to play a little bit of a linguistic game to show that each of those things are examples of faith. And uh, I thought you explained it brilliantly. Oh, thank you. Praise from Caesar. So now we can get to his last comment. This isn't the last paragraph. It's toward the end. It's the last paragraph that we are going to play. And it actually picks up right where we stopped. Okay, let's take a look. The mountains in our lives do not always move how or when we would like. But our faith will always propel us forward. Stop right there. Faith always increases. Jonathan, I'm sorry. Can you go back and play that again? Because he says, I, I wasn't aware of this when I was talking, but he actually just encapsulated exactly what I just said about this equivocation between the use of the word faith. And if you can go back there, I'm sorry, I don't have the timestamp. But it, I know you're good. Our faith will always propel us forward. Look at this. Hang on a second here. Um, the mountains in our lives. The mountains in our lives do not always move how or when we would like. But our faith will always propel us forward. There you go. Faith. So that's all- it, right? The mountains in our lives do not always move how or when we would like which means we may not have faith to have those mountains move, the metaphorical mountains move. But our faith will always propel us forward. That's the greater faith. That's the faith of duty and devotion. Even if you don't have the faith to work miracles or to get God to do things your way, the faith that's more important, and I think for good reason, if we think about it from President Nelson's point of view, The faith that is more important and therefore greater is the faith to continue faithful in the LDS church. See, now I'm just like, okay, so now if we go back and we look at some of the things that we talked about earlier, understanding that he may be using this alternative meaning of faith. So when he says that uh, lazy learners and lax disciples will not even muster, muster a particle of faith, if we now see it in the terms of muster a particle of the, the form of duty and devotion, which would continue to have them supporting the church or whatever, then it, it still makes sense. Um, right. This is part of the confusion. And one of the reasons it's difficult to parse is because yeah. he's using it in different ways. And then he's using it in the same way, even though they're different terms. Because like yeah. you said, um, what was that part that you just read? Uh, you're talking about the lazy learners, lax disciples, cannot even yes. muster a particle of faith, will struggle to muster a particle of faith. Right. The idea then is that you have to be observant and faithful as a member of the church to muster a particle of faith to get God to do things your way. Right. Mm -hmm. See, there he's he's using it in the same sentence. But if God doesn't do it your way right now, he will do it down the line, maybe after you're dead. But eventually he'll get around to it. He has a very long honeydew list. God does. So he can't get to everything right away. And it may be after you die, finally get around to it and say, I'm sorry, it's so far down on the list. Okay, so now you're healed from being gay or whatever it is that the problem yeah. is, right? Yeah. Whatever that mountain is in your life. Um, but w- I think where I was going, let me think where I was going for a second. But so if you do everything you're supposed to do as a, a Mormon, then you will have this faith with God and he will answer your prayers. But if he doesn't answer your prayers, then the more important faith is doing everything you're supposed to do as a Mormon. And it's funny because it gives this example about the rain. You know, God has his own timetable, right? Well, if you're praying for the rain to go away so that you can sit and listen to a prophet speak for two hours without getting drenched and God doesn't answer that prayer, there is no timetable that's going to make that better. He can't answer that prayer the next day because the prophet's gone. He's already flown off to another island by then. It's meaningless by the next day. So I don't know if he's intentionally putting that in there, but it's obvious to me, and I'll go back to the original point, that the faith that is important is the faith to continue obedient, devoted to the LDS church and to its leaders, regardless of whether your faith is able to get God to move your mountains. You know, I'm struck by how... (laughs) You're using this as a way to point out the game that he's playing. You could 
flip that over and just say, you know what, I've now gained this new insight about faith. There's there's two different forms of faith that are important. There's the faith prospectively about trusting God to do, um, you know, to do what you're praying for. And then there's this faithfulness afterwards that the prophet has taught me now that I can now contextualize and handle things when it doesn't go the way that I have. You can make a sacrament talk about that from a faithful perspective, just as he's doing here, even if you acknowledge that that word game is going on here, because that word game could be interpreted as a complex, multi-layered rhetorical uh, device that shows to sophistication. All right. So you want to continue this quote? We got one more. Almost, because this part just occurred to me too. Just last Wednesday, when we're talking with Spencer Wright, it suddenly occurred to me and I started elaborating toward the end about The more irrational the proposition, the more faith it takes to believe it. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so the idea being that it doesn't take any faith to believe something that's rational. It takes no faith to believe the sky is blue. In fact, I would never say I have faith the sky is blue because I can look up and see that it's blue. It doesn't take faith, right? right? But then there are some things that do require faith. But the less likely something is and the more evidence there is against the proposition, the more faith it takes to believe it. Mm. Does that part make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what he's saying here. He's saying that if you pray to God and he doesn't answer your prayer, then it takes more faith and therefore greater faith to continue to trust in him and be an observant Mormon than it would if he answered your prayer. I think he's saying exactly the same thing in different words. Yeah, no, I totally agree. All right, we'll finish. Okay, he's, got, he's got one last paragraph here. Let's keep going. Increase increases our access to godly power. Please know this. If everything and everyone else in the world in whom you trust should fail. Jesus Christ and his church will never fail you. That is such a myopic statement. (laughs) Wait, myopic? That is the worst of the year. It really is. It's just so, I mean, given all of the things, even in recent history that you recounted before about the November 2015 policy, the reversal of it, Prop 8, everything else, you know, there are lots of families that have been failed by the leader of the church without even having to go back to 1978 and all of the realizations from that. Uh, This is just, you know, letting these men guide your, you know, your journey in a way that doesn't allow you to realize any of their own failings in that regard. This is his version of Elder Ballard's Just Trust Us. Because he says, please know this, if everything and everyone else in the world whom you trust should fail, Jesus Christ and his church, which means me, President Nelson, will never fail you. Why? Because you can always trust us. And that's what they say to the faithful. And then as soon as you're like, well, these brethren expect us to trust them unquestioningly. We're supposed to have blind obedience to the brethren. They're like, no, 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 no one ever tells you to have blind obedience. You know, we want you to study it out in your mind. You're not have to, you don't have to blindly follow. And that you have messages here that are like, the prophet will never lead you astray. The church will leave, never fail you. That, you know, the Lord will never fail you. The church will never fail you. I as the prophet will never fail you. It's like, it's a, you know, they want it both ways. Yes, and the greater the trust that is engendered toward an institution or an individual, the greater the sense of betrayal when you find out that they are not trustworthy. And all I'll say on that score is that I trusted the church and its leaders implicitly as they told me to do. And I felt the same way. And and it's almost like you, you also trust God. You trust what they tell you God would say. And so when God says Satan is the father of all lies, you establish a standard for when deception should be allowed. And then you see that deception was employed in the way Joseph Smith executed the formation of the doctrine of marriage, which is like the glowing gem at the heart of many people's faith in Mormonism is eternal families tied to this notion of celestial marriage. And when you see that they tied God into that, then it's a big hit against your understanding of God from the Mormon perspective until you realize that this is just your understanding of God as conveyed through Joseph Smith claiming to speak for God. And that's the big problem of it. 
Yeah, I agree. So can we finish out with his last words in this paragraph? The Lord never slumbers. The Lord never slumbers, nor does he sleep. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He will not forsake his covenants, his promises, or his love for his people. He works miracles today, and he will work miracles tomorrow. Okay, there you go. Just a few things here. First off, the Lord never slumbers, nor does he sleep. He must get kind of tired. I think he has insomnia. I think maybe some, I don't know, warm milk before bed might be of some help there. And then I think this is just validating that we're not going to have to sleep when we get resurrected. Sleep is no longer a thing with the resurrected body. I I guess not. I don't know why that should be. But, you know, it seems like um, all all the fun goes out of the resurrected life. Um, He says uh, he is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. And, you know, even when he was saying this, this is a minor point. I was listening to it live. I thought, wait a second, that he misquoted Hebrews. Because, of course, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And so I went back and I thought maybe they would correct it in the written version. But no, instead of correcting it, they just bracket the word tomorrow and leave it the way he said it, which I suppose is fine. It's a point that was interesting to me. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So you see tomorrow is in brackets, which means it wasn't the original word in the quote. Is it Hebrews 13? nine or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But of course, it's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever is what it says in Hebrews. And then it goes on. He will not forsake his covenants. Uh, This is President Nelson, not Hebrews. He will not forsake his covenant, his promises or his love for his people. He works miracles today and he will work miracles tomorrow. And if he doesn't work miracles today and he doesn't work them tomorrow, then maybe the day after tomorrow, or the day after that. It's his timetable. Yeah. In any in any event, keep paying, keep praying, and keep obeying. Stay faithful. That is the greater faith. And it is kind of a miracle if people would stay faithful to a church where they're told by their prophet to pray to God for a result, and then God can't be bothered. I hear That's you clicking. What are you clicking over there? Uh, I there's a significant video lag. I was trying to see if the uh, OBS virtual camera that I'm using as an intermediary is causing that, but it doesn't seem to be. So there's out of sync audio and video. All right, okay. RFM, we made it through yet another uh, talk. What talk? <laughs> you know, one talk. That's okay. It, this talk needed the attention because you know it's it's. I even hesitate. I know you want to go through every talk at these general conferences, but you know, from a rhetorical perspective, if you're going to talk with family and loved ones and point out how harmful and damaging some of these messages are, if it's not one of the top 15, nobody really cares. It's like a prophet didn't say that. An apostle didn't say that. It's kind of just his opinion. It doesn't matter. It's kind of like, you know, there's this really interesting, fascinating youth conference that I found with a, a stake president talking about a story where there was an investigator who wanted to know about if he could pray to end the pandemic. And the missionaries were like, go ahead, pray and everything. And he, and he said that he started to pray and he prayed to end the pandemic and he heard the voice of God tell him the pandemic is God's purpose and will for the world. You cannot pray it away. Now, this is the stake president telling this to the youth of the church that this is God's message. So he's taking cues from Robert M., or from President Nelson in terms of the, you know, if you pray for something and God's purposes, it's his timetable. So that means if it didn't go away, his purpose is the pandemic. And he's just leaning into that. But he's not a prof- prophet or an apostle. So there was no point in me clipping that little thing out and putting it on my channel because nobody cares what some stake president says. Unless he's excommunicated. Well, well, we will get to this next talk by Elder Bednar next time. But he speaks okay. in the last uh, session of General Conference in April. And he will give you ammunition and support for your position if you're quoting a 70 and not an apostle because oh, he resurrects he resurrects Ezra Taft Benson for from his 14 fundamentals talk right and this no is way. in the last way in the last part remember how president benson said for the next six months your conference edition of the enzyme should stand mm-hmm. next to your standard works and be referred to frequently actually in the original talk he said your marching orders right 
Remember, he said your marching yes. words, but they changed that in the written version. So uh, Elder Bednar says, of course, it's not the enzyme anymore. So it has to be the Liahona. Once again, brackets yes. will come into play. They're very useful when you're giving a general conference talk. <laughs> this is what he says. President Ezra Taft Benson taught. And then I'm sure he said the obligatory quote for the next six months, your conference edition of the bracket Liahona should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. Close quote. <laughs> so there is your ammunition. I mean, President Benson, being quoted by Elder Bednar, makes no distinction between the talks or who's giving the talks in general conference. But these should be next to your standard works and referred to frequently for the next six months. Certainly what I'm doing with them and what we'll continue to do and what I hope will be the final episode next time. Yes. Well, you know, fortunately for future conferences, they've reduced the length of it. I'm really looking forward to looking at that talk because that 14 points of following the prophet talk, like they've had to disavow it, but it keeps injecting itself into conference, even though it was a disavowed at the time it was originally given. So it's always fun to see them bring that, you know, resurrect that bad boy and put it back on the stage. Yes. And I bet if we did a statistical analysis, we <laughs> now it's me. A statistical analysis. I got to take my time with that expression. I'm sure if we did one of those, that uh, what we'd find is that there are certain apostles who like to resurrect Ezra Taft Benson and perhaps Bruce R. McConkie and other apostles who may not be so disposed. Yes, that is uh, very true. <laughs>